It's the doctrine, of course, through the Spirit that builds the type of church. We depend on the doctrine. Build the church which is the pillar and ground of the truth. That's right. We can't have a church short of the doctrine. Whatever we're using to guide and govern ourselves is going to determine what type of organization we're going to be. And if we're looking to be the glorious church, it's going to cost us some sacrifice to get lined up with the Word. We can't live as we please and be a glorious church. We can't be the children of God doing as we please. We have to make our consecrations and hold them there when the devil come to pull you loose from them. We can say we're going to do one thing when the test comes, we don't do it because the flesh wants to do something else. We know to do good, but the flesh, if we don't have power and strength over our own will, we won't be the church because we have to determine within ourselves that it's worth it. And that takes faith. We don't have to do it just because it's pleasant. Or refuse to do it because it's inconvenient or unpleasant. But we got a whole line. A whole line. Many have failed because they didn't want to go no further. Too much trouble to submit ourselves. Through the word of God, as we figure it in some way like those poor children that will get by doing less than what God has required of school. And we've got plenty of years to get ready, to get consecrated, dedicated. We've got plenty of time. And later on we'll do it, but if it's easy, chances are that it's not going to satisfy the requirements of God because it's easy for everybody to do it. But those things are contrary to holy living Don't cause us some trouble. It's the Word of God. We're going to the third chapter of Second Corinthians. We know what the third chapter of 1 Corinthians tell us. <laughs> we haven't measured up and don't want to measure up and haven't measured up yet and, and, and past due measuring up and yet carnal and yet looking out for ourselves and we don't want to get into too much of that. I hope that we're getting to the place where we can hush our mouth whether we want to or don't. We've got victory over the flesh, the world and the devil. The world wants you, love not the world. The devil wants you to sift your sweet. Stay away from him. Uh-huh. And the flesh. It's plans, things that it might be enjoyed. The flesh will get us in trouble like it did Adam and Eve. And it'll get us in trouble as it did Jacob's first son. What was his name? Hmm? You don't know? Esau. Mm-hmm. Once was a man named Jacob. He was a God man who God loved. He was the father of twelve sons. Try to name them one by one. One was Reuben. Reuben got in trouble. He went up to his father's bed. You remember? And his father, when he was given out the blessings before he died, he says, Reuben, my beginning of my strength, my firstborn, weak, unstable as water. For he went up to his father's bed. Flesh. Love not the world, neither things in the world. We're talking about things that hinder. 
All in the world, lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. Lust means I want to do it. I want to do it. I have a strong abiding desire to do it. Lust of the flesh. I want to do it. The lust of the eyes. I want to see it. And the lust. Pride of life. I want to own it. I want to have it. I want to get it. Lust. These are not of the Father. Therefore, leave it alone. All right. But are of the world. All right. We're going to be gone from here and the world's going to be gone. But the Word of God, the Scripture said, abideth forever. All right. So, Lord, help us to wean, get weaned back from our self-will. Self-will has gotten us into every trouble just about we've gotten into. Just about. Get ourselves in trouble. And pray hard to get out of it. And God told you to stay out of it. And you got in it anyhow. And pray, Lord, help me out. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. My last prayer before I go to bed is, Lord, help me out of this mess. And get up in the morning. It's on my mind. Get me out of this mess. And the Lord said, did I tell you not to get in it? Okay. How many times can we be delivered and faith still hold? Help us, my Lord God. The Word of God is to be kept. It was sent here for our learning, for our admonition. Amen. And able to present us faultless before the throne of the Word. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Do you put ourselves on the back? Or do we as others, do we as some others, the epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? Or need we as some others, ministers, epistles of commendation to you? Amen. Or letters of commendation from you there are certain places that I can't go preach unless I have commendations from commendations from the congregation from which I were left or the minister alliance in that area they don't know me they're not going to hear me or when I come to you do I need to bring letters of commendation recommendation before you will accept me here Paul sent one with Phoebe he said receive her and help her in that business. For she has been a seeker of many. And also Aquila and Priscilla had risked their own lives for our sakes. They get sent commendations to the saints where the minister were going to travel. If they were young and unknown in the work, then those who were known would write them a letter of recommendation or commendation to um, that they may work. But Paul said, Do we? As some others that are less known, that have been less involved, that we need epistles or letters of commendation to you. We come to you, do you want to see my letter? Or do we need letters of commendation from you when we're getting ready to go? No, no, he said, you are our epistle. You're the letter, I mean, you're the evidence of our work and our call written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ ministered by us. God wants us to be letters from Christ on our jobs. Not talking too much, but living it. Letters from God. A sweet spirit. A not smart aleck. And not a drop clown. Not a cut up. Not a tattletale. Living in the sight of all men as lights letters from Jesus dressed right on time conscientiously doing our work not bothering folks condemning and dooming and damning folks that they might be interested in what you have you are light to the world and the light draws or light repels, depending on who you're dealing with. All right. You are our epistle. You are a letter. While we minister to you until you are a letter, a drawing card, as it were. For as much you are manifestly declared, declared to be epistles of Christ, ministered by us, or ministered to by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not in tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of your heart. You know, huh? And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 
because he had made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Plenty of letters around, plenty of information in letters, but how many are, have that in their heart to do? Many quote scriptures, but how many can, will keep them? It made us who are ministers. They not to say that they're of themselves, but God did it. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life, even to the letter. But if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, that's the Old Testament law, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses when he came down from the mountain, his face shined. For the glory of his confidence, which glory was to be done away with, which he brought down the law on tables of stone, which were just temporary. Why did he bring the law down? Who could tell us? Why did God give the law? What does scripture say? Hmm? What did you say? Schoolmaster of the Lord Christ? All right. But that sin, come on. There are things that we know are wrong that we probably shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, you know like putting your fingers in the paint or stepping in the wet concrete or parking across somebody's driveway. We know we shouldn't be doing that, don't we? But when they put the sign up, then what? That makes the transgression worse, doesn't it? It makes sin appear exceeding sinful. And once we put the sign up, once it is written in your sight, well, then that's just rebellion to go ahead and do it anyway. And rebellion is worse than just carelessness. That's right. That's right. Keep off the grass. Well, maybe you shouldn't be walking on the grass anyway. But there's a path going across here. I think I'll walk on it. And then they come by and put up the sign, keep off the grass. And that's why the law was given. People were not following after the conscience. They had the law of conscience. But people were searing their conscience and going on doing what they pleased. The thoughts of their heart was evil continually and God drowned them. They had law of conscience. And the Bible said that law was accusing or excusing them, but they did not give heed and that was not enough to keep them corralled, keep them off of exceeding sin, keep them off of wickedness. So the scriptures say God gave the law that sin might appear exceeding sinful. Put us on notice that this is no longer going to be tolerated. They put a sign up. You shouldn't park in the traffic lanes. And then people are all blowing their horn and hank honking and throwing brakes on skiing everywhere trying to get around your car. And so the city fathers, they have a sign printed up that said, No parking. No stopping and no standing. Now do it anyhow. And you're going to get a ticket. And it might cost you something. Like maybe $50 in Springfield. Some places you're going to cost you a whole lot more than that. Or have your car towed away. Because you have done something exceedingly wrong now. Not only did you not use good judgment, but you also disobeyed the sign. And... You can't plead ignorance. But people who cannot read cannot drive either. They're not allowed to drive. You have to pass the test. That requires reading. Okay, so sin might appear exceeding um, sinful. The words are to that effect anyway. And so that's why the word was given. Now the letter is not just what we're interested in. We're interested in understanding what the letter says. That's why we have lawyers. Those who have done much time studying as what the intent of the law is. What is the spirit of the law? What are they trying to tell us? We see the, the law, but what does it mean? And so we have attorneys who have gone to school and studied, 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 trying to figure out what this meant. And that we get the spirit of the law. Not just the letter of the law. 
but the spirit of the law. And it helps to know why the law was given as far as understanding what the law is. And so we have to deal with all the ordinances of God and all of His commandments as to what they mean after you have read what they say. But we had a letter of the Old Testament because the brother did not have what you say, the discernment and the uh, the breadth of understanding and depth of it to interpret that law. So they went and done just what the law said, no more, no less. But here, on the New Testament, with the Spirit to help us, then we can um, kind of go a little further than just the letter, but we can go to the why, beyond the what. The letter killeth. You get in trouble trying to keep the letter because it leads to any loophole. But the Spirit comes to give us full understanding, and that's life. And the ministration of the old law had a glory that was to be done away with. Thou shalt not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious. Now we have a problem when we go to the law with the Old Testament attitude. See? We're still looking to get out of doing what the Word teaches. We're still trying to find a way not to do it. And the Lord gives us understanding of what we're supposed to be doing and why we're supposed to be doing it, but we're still trying to find a technical way of avoiding it, and that won't work. He says, that letter going to kill you. You can get in the jail. Mm-hmm. When the Lord told us what not to covet, and we take the attitude we can cover anything else, whatever else is not covered, then we're in trouble. New Testament said, Thou shalt not covet. That's the law of here. And the Old Testament said, Thy neighbor's cattle, his house, his wife, or anything that is thy neighbor's. That's pretty good. But sometimes we'll find a way to get out of that. Because it didn't say his cat. It only said his dog and his horse. So we'll see if they can get his goat. The letter going to get you in trouble. The Bible does not forbid smoking cigarettes. And so, what are y'all telling me you don't smoke for? The Bible didn't say anything about smoke. God said he put it all here for the use of man. So now we are smoking and you have violated maybe not the letter, but you did violate the spirit. The letter, or keeping the letter will kill us. Because God wants us to be more honest than that. He wants us to be more thorough in obedience to his will and to get involved in nitpicking and trying to figure out how to get out of keeping the word. We have the law still being kept in certain sects today. Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist, you know what I mean? We're keeping Sabbath days, so we don't have to. And Bob said, don't do that. We shouldn't be doing it. We shouldn't be doing it. Not just in case we don't supposed to be doing it for that reason. <coughs> Pardon me. Not in any voluntary humility. You remember that voluntary humility, which the scripture speaks against. We don't do it because they want to do it. That they, the Bible said, you just want to have uh, to uh, what is it, boast in your flesh that you're on our side. If I joined the Jehovah's Witnesses, they would probably be. Um, excuse me, Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, Seventh Day Adventists in particular, they give me the right hand of fellowship See? because I'm keeping their day. I've admitted that they're right. And they give me a good handshake. But for me to do that, I'd have to do it, volunteer to do it, because there's no conviction for me to keep the seventh day. I don't believe it. It's not applicable to New Testament saints. So no voluntary humility. If it's not required, I don't want to do that, because in the first place, it'll get you into some other things. I would say if you keep the law, keep... One law and you're subject to the whole law. Because the law came as a unit. Like a ball with a hole in it. The air is going out if you just have a small hole. Because it's a body of air in that. All right.
I was reading along in this thing telling us about the letter of the law and how we are obligated. Then in that fourth chapter, he says, seeing that we have this ministry, we receive mercy. We faint not. I'm not going to faint away from grace. If I start out with grace and finish up in the flesh, he said, uh, well, how are we going to do that? But you have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness or handling of the word of God deceitfully. So I'm getting you to do what they want you to do, get you to give your money, get you to do this and that, all under the guise of keeping the word of God. He said, that's dishonest. That's crafty. To twist the scripture to get people to do what you want them to do. Not walking in craftiness or handling the word of God deceitfully. Not to produce our own ends. But by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. That's what we're dealing with. Since God would preach the word of God, we are not preaching it just for your head. Is to get the attention of your conscience. That's where you're going to have to be alive. To be alive to God. Your conscience has to be involved. That's why the word needs to come to such that you. If you're wrong you're condemned within yourself. For that wrong. I mean you want to forget it straight. But if it doesn't bother your conscience at all. That doesn't mean that you're right. It means that you're probably ignorant. Or you have seared your conscience. You're not careful. You're not careful. Or you've been talking to a service and didn't even hear the message. Or you went out to get a drink and went back and got another drink. And that's why you got another one. But it let us know that you're indifferent in the services and you don't care. And that, that's dangerous too. So he said we commend ourselves to the conscience. We want to preach the meaning of the word. We want to preach what God's will is toward the word. And let by your own conscience decide what you ought to be doing. Commend ourselves to every man's conscience. That's where we serve God or don't. Uh, we're in Romans 2.14. We're going to hold that place. We're going to read this to just go along with it. Therefore, thou would... Oh, we don't want to read that. We want to read 14. For when the Gentiles... Or the 13. For the, not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they didn't have the written law, it wasn't taught to them, do by nature the things contained in the law, they're still under the law of conscience as they started out before the law came. See, everybody was under the conscience, and there was no Jews and Gentiles at the beginning. It wasn't until Abraham came along that there came a divine. And those who were drowned in Noah's deluge at that time they drowned for violating the laws of conscience mm -hmm. there was no orderly body of laws they had laws but not like mosaic law that governed a man's just about every action but the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature things contained in law as they are supposed to be doing in the days of Noah and before, then they are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Lying is wrong. We don't need a law to teach us that lying is wrong. Injuring our neighbor is wrong. Stealing is wrong. We don't need a law to tell us that stealing is wrong. We go back two steps on that one. We've been going back past Moses' law and on back to the law of conscience to let us know there are some things that ought not be done. And you do it anyway, then your conscience or your thoughts, your conscience also bearing witness to your wrong, and their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. You know, our, our, our conscience will accuse us when we're wrong? That's why we, and the Bible says that's why some men sear their conscience or shut it up. They determine, they do it, and run over it anyway. So even when we're dealing with the Word of God and we're dealing with the ministry and dealing with one another, our conscience is going to help us out if we'll let it. Amen. You're going to sit around and say, I didn't know it, I didn't understand it. Well, I didn't know this and that. Just got to say, yes, you did. And then sometimes we kind of soft pedal a little bit, try to back up a little bit because the conscience is coming too strong against us. Well, I mean, uh, thus and thus, I mean, thus and thus, I mean, I mean, I mean. 
Come on clean with it. Go back to straighten out a problem that you've caused. And you say, if I've done any wrong. And your conscience said, you did. Come on, shut up! I'm trying to get this thing straightened out. If I've done any wrong. And your conscience said, yeah, you did. Well, I didn't mean any harm. Well, the spirit conscience said, you sure did. Now, I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to say, you might. Because you're not repenting. But I returned all that I stole. No, you didn't. You bought such or such thing and it's still in your house. Go get it. The conscience accusing you. You see, if we lost, it's going to be lost in spite of what God has done. He gave us his conscience because we didn't have the Holy Ghost. So he'll give you a conscience and the conscience will accuse you. Your own conscience. You can argue all you want to against somebody else's accusations. When you come to argue against your conscience, then, then you'll argue with yourself. So who knows what you meant more than you do? Now you can tell me anything you want to, but your conscience is going to tell you you're wrong. We show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. In your head, in your mind, in your heart. There's a struggle going on for truth to be manifest. Tell the truth. I, I didn't mean no harm. I, I know I didn't shake your hand, but I, that, that was just, uh, I, I, I was thinking about something else. No, you wasn't. Conscious said, no, you saw it right there. And you deliberately went around. You're just in the habit of forgetting and overlooking people. Your attitude's bad. Your conscience said, your attitude's bad. Oh, I wish my conscience. You can't argue with yourself. The Word of God tunes your conscience. And even sinners, the Word of God will tune their conscience. That's why we try to teach them the Word. Tell them what's what God say. That's right. Tell the sinner that. It'll tune his conscience. You know why folks are getting away with so much? There's so much crazy stuff going on. Their conscience has been tuned down. The law of God is not being preached and therefore the people are not being charged by their conscience. And it's going to get worse and worse. The more they shut down the Word of God, the worse the nation is going to get. See, the Word of God is the basis of our behavior, our right behavior. And the devil wants a clean field. So, there just be situation ethics. That's all. If it feels good, do it. If you can get away with it, do it. You do it because he'd have done it first to you if you hadn't done it to him. What do we have to govern when you remove? The Bible said if the foundation be destroyed, then what shall the people do? Oh, we're going to take God out of the Constitution. Take God off of the money. Any God we trust, no, no more. We're going to take the Ten Commandments off the courthouse. Of we're going to get all the Word of God far out of the vision of the people as we can. Then, how's their conscience going to be dealt with? God ordained that the Word and God would affect the conscience. Cain and Abel. How many folks know who Cain was now? And what happened to Abel? How many people know that? How many people know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? How many of our children? No. About the flood. How many know? About Achan. David and Goliath. Little color. You give the same children little coloring books and things with Bible stories in them to kind of keep their mind fresh. So that when things go wrong, the conscience is there to tell them. See Sinful. Next, we're going to have justification for incest. Oh, no! They never do that! No! Who ever thought that they publicly, even our governor, president, would uphold homosexuality and go to their meetings to encourage them? You know what incest? They're going to want to remove the limits on children getting involved in sex. On down, low as they can go. Teach them that. There are some wicked minds out there that think that's going to make things better. It's going to make it worse. The law was given to make that sin might appear exceeding sinful. You know why people can't find anything wrong with homosexuality much anymore? 
They heard much about it. Tell them. There was a great wickedness, homosexuality. It untracks the will of God and the purpose of God in His creation. It's unsanitary. It's unhygienic. Poisons the blood supply by those that use it. And sends around diseases like HIV and which produces AIDS. Change of blood and body fluids in a manner God did not intend. And they're suffering for it. Not enough, evidently. Keep doing it. It's the Word of God that needs to go out. We need to talk to the sinners for their own good. If they never get saved, stir their conscience up. God talks with us through our conscience. And God talks to the sinner through his conscience. That's right. Sometimes sinners. You ever heard of that uh, conscience fund? You know the conscience fund? It happens to most governments, generally with uh, tax takers. That they have an income that comes into the government every year. There's a pot for the conscience fund. That people who have cheated and lied and gotten out of things, claimed the deductions that didn't belong to them. They send their money in, but they don't identify themselves to the conscience fund. They're not saints. I'm not getting saints. It's just that the Word of God is still getting to some sinners through the conscience. It's good to teach our children if they never get saved. Something that God can use to limit their misbehavior. Murder. First crimes after the fruit was eaten that we know of. A capital crime. Who said it's wrong? You know what you get for murder now? Six, eight years maybe. Maybe. Sometimes it's just a matter of months. If you're underage, they're letting you out when you're 18. If you commit, killed somebody when you're 16, when you're 18, you go free. Murder. It's a capital crime, but who worries about it? Without the conscience, they're going to bother you. They're going to bother you. They're going to feel like the evil men and seducers are going to get worse. As the Word of God is preached less, the conscience is going to be freer. Well, what does a conscience use anyway? What's the strength of the conscience? If it's not the Word of God and a terrible happening in hell. There is no strength to the conscience if there's no God. Well, if I kill him, he won't be around here. I might need him after a while. I'll be sad. I won't kill him anyhow because I'm mad. That's right. And so murder is way, way up. I saw it in a little article in the paper, I think they said something about it. What did they I don't know what paper. What was the magazine? It was Pink and not helping. It's making them worse. I beg your pardon. The less spanking you get, the worse we get. When spanking was in vogue, we didn't have children kicking the teachers, spitting on them, knocking them down, beating up their daddies. I guess when a man boy gets big enough, he gets 18, 19 years old, go and whip your dad. Fighting. No respect. Why? No correction. It's just a great big lie they're telling you that spanking don't help. If you got some sense, when you know how to apply it, it's sure going to help. It, the beating itself is not what we're looking for. There's a psychological lesson that goes with the why you're getting this whipping. They need to know why they're getting it, and they need to know what's going to happen if they do it again. You're going to have some unpleasantness around here, and you may not feel like sitting down for a while. God don't like ugly, and you're acting very ugly. And if you don't like it, I'll whip you again, straighten up your face. Well, maybe they don't know how. Maybe they think uh, spanking a child means knocking up in the closet or somewhere. 
You know, maybe he might rise up and get you after a while. But the word of God is right without a witness. There was plenty of time the nation did not have the fears we have now. When I was a boy, people sleep out in the yard. You get too hot in the house, you wouldn't air condition, just grab your, your roll, or mattress, whatever, drag it off the bed out in the grass. Spend the night out there, praise the Lord, God's air conditioning. And watch the stars. That's right. Nobody come along and put a pistol in your face and said, Where's your wallet? It didn't bother you. You didn't even have to lock the doors up at night. It wasn't until after World War II that they started using storm doors. You might have a screen, you might not. Those poor folks didn't have one. So you know, let the wind blow through. That's right. And you got a whipping too, and the neighbors give you a whipping if you don't watch out. That's right. They correct you. Nowadays, you don't give them a whipping, and you and whip the neighbor. Children, all they're waiting on to get big enough to take over, and they're not going to obey. They're not going to obey you if you don't instill a respect in them and teach them. They're not going to obey you. Just forget it. The word of God is right. You can try to do it your way if you want to, but you've got troubles coming, and you're guaranteed you've got troubles coming. If you don't train them right, because they're carnal. God said for you to train them. So we'll wait until they bowl up or get up over us and look down in our face and tell us to shut up and we ain't going to do it and get out the way. And then we say, oh Lord, help me. Oh Lord, please. What's that name, old brother? Listen. The conscience. The conscience will interpret that word for us even if we don't want them to sometimes. Thou shalt not steal. Well, I ain't going to steal it. I'm just going to borrow it and forget to give it back. You know, and no, no, no. The other country lets you know that that's stealing. And you say, I didn't mean to keep it. And the country said, yes, you did. That was uh, your plan before you started out, was to take this and keep it. Be careful, saints. When you borrow from the saints one another, you ought to return it back. Right? Don't take that the letting you have for granted and forget it conveniently. They got your books in there, in your bookcase. That's right. Your hammer in the tool shed. Your, your wheel burn over there in that shed. That's right. Borrowed a cup of sugar. And I'll send it right back. Most things don't have to do that anymore. But you borrow another cup. You'd be like the baker. I see my shortcomings now. Was that the baker? Or was it the butcher? The butler, oh, somewhere in there. Bitch, you the bigger the butler. Yes, sir. Look at that. Um, Joseph told him when you restored back, he told him his dream that he's going to be restored back to his place in the palace. And you go back in there, speak a word for me. He went back in there and was just enjoying his freedom so much and having a great time. Forgot all, didn't even think about poor Joseph until he needed him. And then it returned to his mind all of a sudden. I supposed to be putting in the word today. Oh, I see my, I see my, my shortcomings now. Lord, help us to see our shortcomings. Our conscience would help us to see it. Make us more honest. And quit lying. We be more careful and quit saying I didn't mean to. When you did. But if you got a poor tune on your conscience, sometimes you get away with that. You think. But making little pet excuses for doing what you had no business in doing, and the conscience lets you know. Through the Spirit, you knew what you were doing. Yeah, you knew it. You knew it. And then you have to admit it if you're going to stay safe. And then make apology for what the problem was. We can be a refined group of saints if we give heed to the Word, especially with the Spirit working. The Holy Spirit worked through your conscience. There was a time when we all we had was conscience. Now we've got the Holy Spirit to go with the conscience. So the Spirit through the conscience speaks to you plainer. Don't do that. All right? The letter killeth, but something about the Spirit. You can live. Follow after the flesh, you're going to die. You crucify the flesh, mortify the flesh through the Spirit. Gonna live. You see how the enemy got it set up in our nature, Adam and Eve, how far out they sold us to where it seems like that even after we get saved, 
There's something that's trying to keep us going our way, contrary to the word. Contrary to the word. So God wants the word preached. Not to condemn us, but it will. But not to condemn us, but to keep us in line. Just as God saves the sinner, by bringing back the word that he's heard, and bringing him under, con under conviction, God also can guide the saint through the very word that we hear. To get us out of trouble or keep us out of trouble. That's right. That's what the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. For when the Gentiles who were not had the word, uh, word preached to them, do by nature respect their parents, the Bible says the word of God say, children, obey your parents. Honor your mother and your father. Gentiles can do that, and God bless them. See? But we have some of those folks who call themselves God's people who make excuses for not honoring their mother and father. And Jesus said, you got a problem. The word of God said, you honor your mother and father, and you say that it's going bad. In other words, this is a gift. This belongs to the church. I can't give it to her. I can't give it to them. You're more responsible to see that your parents are not suffering and to give away your finances could be used for the relief. Because you make no uh, know the word of God doing things like that. Those that are honoring their mother and father now, don't forget that you're going to be a mother and father probably some of these days. God looking out for you. Right. Mistreat your parent and uh, you might have that coming. Because they're watching and learn how to do it, but watching how you treat yours. For sure, uh -huh. by nature things contain in law, these having not the law or law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. Their conscience also bearing witness. Don't you know our conscience bearing witness of the things we say and the things we do and the things we think and all that? We can't go up there boasting and bragging when the conscience already told you that you need much help. When the word is preached, this conscience tell you that's you. Get your help. Go get some help. You say, no, just sit still and get worse. How are you going to get better just sitting still? Don't make any effort to straighten it. Just sit still. Conscience says you need to get some help. Some folks will spend a lot of time at the altar and some people will never go. Never go. As though it's an insult for them to go. Is it an affront to my pride to go to the altar? I ain't going up there. I'll take care of it myself and don't do it. Don't do it. You know, confession is nine-tenths of the solution. Well, you can't get anything done unless you admit that you need something done. Right? Didn't the Bible say, Jesus told them people, he said, they said, are, are, are we blind? He said, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But since you say you see, you won't admit you're blind, then you're in your sins. Can't get you out. Can't get you out. Conscience. We can get ourselves all hooked up and lose our tenderness. Where we know we're doing nothing wrong, never done nothing wrong. God's got you marked down red marks all over your report. And you haven't done anything about it. Pride. All right. For in the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature things contained in the law. These having not the law are law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts to meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, before God condemn you and could judge you, your conscience only had done it. All right. Is that hard to understand that? Mm -hmm. yeah, have you ever had your conscience tell you that you didn't say that right? Or the spirit, whatever, or whatever dispensation you're working under. You ever hear somebody say, well, you didn't do that right? Mm -hmm. I mean, your conscience accused you of kicking the dog. Go back and tell that dog you're sorry. If you are. Well, sometimes we do feel like we've mistreated the animals. 
I mean, you might have to be a little sun, a little vain, but anything to anything to be free. I mean, to be an accusation, uh, you know, by the Spirit, that's 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 hard on you. I'd rather. Be... He'll forgive you. Dogs don't hold it against you unless you keep doing it, and they don't want to come around you then because they get nervous around you. But there's children. Apologize to the children. Apologize to one another when we've been grossly misbehaved, when we've been bad. The spirits say, fix it. You don't want to go and tell your husband or your wife that you was wrong. Well, you were wrong, so that didn't change anything. Whether you don't do it or whether you do don't, it won't change a thing except your status. Sometimes the joy's gone out of our soul because we will not fix things by our conscience our conscience tell us about we won't fix it we let time take care of it oh it'll be forgot after a while but it's still on the report card it's still on your record you know, so we want to get it fixed before we forget it some are hoping for the time when it's forgotten let's fix it before we forget it so we can keep our testimony together and keep our joy he showed us that how God works with the conscience to uh, keep us straight, keep us honest. Take the strength out of our bragging. We boasting in this and boasting that, and I'm this and that, testifying high. And the conscience said, "It's a shame we you up standing for telling people all that stuff." And I'm trying to try to get you straight all the time. If you talk so loud, I can't talk to you. Honesty. We won't be stumbling over our own testimony. Our testimony is for our building, it's for our encouragement, it's not stumbling over. Right. That we may have boldness in the day of Christ. Boldness in the day of Christ. You see, when we know the Lord said that which is done in secret can be shot up in the housetop. We have to be careful how we boast when we know when there's somebody here who knows our testimony and knows what we know. Let me stand up here and tell everybody how good I've been and how faultless my youth has been and how I never got into anything when there's somebody sitting back there that knew me. About the time I get ready to get up and say that somebody walks in that was with me in my childhood, my teenage years. And then I'll have to soft pedal what I was about to say. Because somebody knows. <laughs> yeah, somebody knows. So there is some time when, you know, uh, we have to stand and fear one another in our home. And don't need to sit for bragging so good when you are mistreating the children. And you're sitting there looking and listening to you. And you yell at them, scream at them, push the one on the floor. Shove them outdoors, no coat on, because it made you mad. Call them a little rat, or whatever, you know. We gotta, we gotta be careful, you know. The Lord wants to work on us and tune a fine tune our lives, amen. So they can hear our prayers. God wants to hear the prayers of the saints. I wonder why you ain't get to see no miracles. Well, you you breaking the miracle yourself. I wonder why ain't nobody here. Well, you, you, you dishonest things. Conscious accusing you. Lord, help me so I can say it clear. I started raising my hand, but the Bible says without wrath, without. I sure was mad this morning. Put your hand down, get that straight. Without wrath, holy hand up. Well, we have a little doubt in here. I ain't sure I'm saved. But all the rest of them raised their hand. And Paul said, Woe is me. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
So we need to want to go to prayer. And that's where God wants us to get our conscience down to where it don't stop us from doing what's not right. We'll be better saints. In the long run, we will. If we're really concerned about it, we'll be better saints. The next time we see one of the saints, we'll go purposely away out of our way. Because we neglected last time and tried to get by and feel like that we love the saints. And have you get to pray and Lord wake you up at night about some of this stuff, then you'll do what's right. You don't make excuses for not speaking. You don't speak to some all the saints sometimes. Right? I don't mean everybody you see running around like a chicken and shaking everybody's hand. That's not just what we do. But what has your attitude been about greeting the saints? You know, sometimes we can show our love with ten dollars. Sometimes we can give them fifty dollars. Sometimes we can pick them up and take them to Chicago or down to New Orleans or whatever they need real bad. But most of the time, all we need to do is greet them, give them a hug now and then, and that takes care. Would you rather do that than go to New Orleans or to go to Chicago? Some won't even do that. They make excuses for them not greeting the saints. Your conscience. You know, your conscience will tune up if we preach it often enough. Sooner or later, you'll start doing it because God ordained that the Word of God would provoke us to good. Oh, we we'll won't be weighed in the balance of time wanting. Say, how many times did you hear the message on get love to one another? But did you do it? No, I just didn't want to just do it just because somebody said so. I feel like you ought to be moved to do it. Well, let me ask you why you weren't moved. You say you're saved. Why is it that you ignore Satan? How can you ignore people? Don't you know this is a body that's edified by love and your love is not operating and you don't feel like... You don't, you don't love the saints? Why, did, why, why didn't you love them? That's a small thing. I'm just using this for a little example here. Because this is something we can all get involved in. Greeting one another. You say if you greet those whom you love only, then what thank have you? You shake hand with those who shake hand with you, then what thank have you? The best thing you can do when it comes to greeting is grab that one that you've been having problems with and give him a hug. Ask him how they're getting along. Pray for you. And do pray for him. Now we're making some effort here. We're making some progress. We decide that one that I can't stand, I'm going to pray for him. Because maybe they can't stand me. So while I'm praying for them, I'm going to pray for me. Lord, well, make me a little more lovable. What did I do? I ain't done nothing to them. Are you concerned? about your relationship with the other saints? Aren't you concerned? If they just tend to be in I'll tend to mind, we'll be okay. Hmm. That's in violation of the word. Did you understand that? Well, you can't do everything the Bible says. Well, you can do what you can do. How many people are always trying to bring in bondage? I don't want to do that. Oh, my. Are you saved? No. Saved as anybody else. I'm not sure you say. Well, when you get to heaven, I'll be there. If you make it, I'll be there. You don't have to shake no hand and go to heaven. Yes, but you shouldn't be contrary and refuse to do it. Because that let us know there's something amiss in your spirit. That's one of the small things we can do for one another. Did the Bible say that the brethren wrote the letters and generally said, greet some? They're not even there. Greet Stephanus and, and greet... Uh, Quilla, my mother and their mother and all that kind of stuff. Just greet, greet, greet. And we're amongst them won't greet. Let him know that he that converteth the sinner from his, the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide the multitude of sins. First Peter, and we're going to conclude this uh, fifth chapter. The church that is at Babylon elected together with you. We're concluding the chapter. Now, let's see the message. Sit still for a while. The church that is at Babylon elected together, elected together with you, salute you. And so do Marcus, my son. Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you. And all that are in Christ and Jesus. Amen. Yes. Uh, about, about what? About conscience. conscience, yes. How do you get uh, the tender, conscience tender again? Well, there's no guarantee they will.
Bible said in one place you pray that God would give you repentance. If God give up on you, you won't. It's a matter that the Lord return to trouble your spirit. If He can get you saved, He can tenderize your conscience. But in the first place, you have to be subject because uh, this uh, being disobedient to the conscience is very much similar to being disobedient to the spirit of God. So people who can blaspheme, say things that they ought not be saying concerning religious things, quite often they, they may not have good make God, but many some have. So it's the thing of if they t- harden their hearts and keep it that way, God do what we want to do if we're praying for them. But there's no guarantee they can get back. Some have died. Went to the guy. Went to the hospital one time and a man was in there and he was dying. And uh, whoever was with me, I don't remember who he was, said, Did you ask Jesus to save me? The man cussed. He cussed and said, What have you ever done for me? He was on his deathbed. Now, if I didn't believe in Jesus, I wouldn't take no chances when I'm on my deathbed. Good sense, I don't take no chances. I'm about ready to die. And the, the, as far as I know, there ain't nothing else can help me but Jesus. I, w- I wouldn't curse him. But see, that's what he was. Smoker and alcoholic. Say a bad word. There's no guarantee that if we harden our heart, that we can unharden. See, how can he do it? Giving heed to the word of God. That's how he can do it. But the very reason he didn't do it in the first place because he's hard he's hard on it we shouldn't really have to spend much time on saints getting along right did not the spirit himself God himself teach you that we should love one another the church that is at Babylon elected together with you salute with you all right The Lord have told us that if we love only those that love us, then we don't get enough for them. Salute all them that have a rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you. Amen. That was the conclusion of Hebrews. They wrote a letter, they remembered the saints in that particular location. They didn't try to make excuses about how am I supposed to remember all them people. Then salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus, be with your spirit, amen. Written in Rome. All right. Let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary necessary uses that they be not unfruitful all that are with me salute thee greet them that love us in the faith grace be with you all amen it was written to Titus ordained the first bishop of the church of Christians from Nicopolis of Macedonia we're just saying that the brethren exhorted us to consider one another and they did leave us an example of considering one another and we and ourselves do not make laws we and ourselves are not supposed to be set in rules we're supposed to keep the rules the Bible set for them. that's why they were set for them. now downplaying one another ignoring one another bad mouthing one another failing to set forth the standard becomes worse when it's preached or when it's written. See, the law was given to make sin exceeding sinful. Now, when we handle our children, generally we tell them, you knew better. Right? That increases the seriousness of the violation when they knew better, don't they? You knew better, didn't you? Yeah, you knew better. Oh, yeah, you knew better. You knew better. And then, didn't I tell you? And we use that on our children. Didn't I tell you? I'm getting tired of talking to you. I done told you two or three times not to do that. That increases the seriousness of the violation. 
What about the word of God? When God sends the word to us and we continue to fail, come to it. Does that increase? We knew better. You know better. Didn't you? God said, lighten us. We know that. Our conscience accused us of that last time we done it. And we didn't do it. And now we're doing it again. Why? There's something we're short something in our spirit. We need to get down on some way and pray hard for ourselves. Not to do things. Deliberately late. Could have got there on time in the spirit. Got to the place where this conscious, it don't, spirit don't bother you no more. That, that's not bother you anymore because you already blocked that out. It's just like going to visit my uncle. It don't make no difference whether I get there on time or not. If people tell you to come to the house at 6 o'clock for dinner, you shouldn't be coming at 6.30. Folks sitting back waiting on you, food burning, or it's cold. Confidence in an unfaithful man. Broken tooth and foot out of joint. People say they're saved and they can just about do any old thing wrong. I mean, the Spirit has told them that what not to do and what not to do. They don't bother them. Spirit don't bother them. Anything. We're wasting our time preaching some things to some folks. They can get up and leave the service and don't make no difference at all. It's just like, you know, if they're leaving uh, uh, Walgreens or someplace or Walmarts. Get them leave. What's that got to do with it? They don't bother them. I mean, conscious. How am I going to make it to heaven when our conscious dies out on us? What are we going to do when the Spirit takes his leave? Those that were in fire for God, those that were stirred up for God, those that had great testimonies, let some indifference get a hold of them. Well, all they're doing is waiting for death. I'll be okay when death comes get me. I'll be okay. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. No, sir. I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right. That's the essence of our, our, our salvation. It's to change our life and we to grow in grace. Grow. Grow. Be more graceful. Be an example. Most of us are not being examples. We're just being ourselves. And don't want to grow. We feel like we're good now. But the righteous scarcely be saved. Mm-hmm. Wave in the balance of justice, true. Mm-hmm. Some of these things, we just put a little effort in it. Just put a little effort in it. There's no great big thing. It's just... A, you gotta want to. Right. You can wear your seat belt all the time and put effort in it. You resolve you're gonna wear it. See? If you consecrate yourself to do it, you might skip, you might slip some time. But until you break your consecration, you put it back on. I just let me just a little example. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we might be riding without it, but we should all wear our seatbelts, right? We should wear them, even in town. You can say, well, I only got a couple blocks to go, I'm going to drive careful. Somebody swing around that corner and knock your car up on the sidewalk. And your neck is all hurting, and the man comes and says, do you have a seatbelt on? You know, there's a little place on the report, so they won't forget it. You know, they get on the clipboard, and on down the bottom says seatbelt or no. Uh, well, you wearing your seatbelt? Uh, I just, oh, I, I, most of the time, I, a break, would you? <laughs> I said, well, you were in your seat now. Well, how about the Lord catch you that way? Hmm? How was your attitude when this problem rose? What was your attitude? Hmm? Uh, well, I generally try to always... Uh, oh, brother. We're going to quit because there's other things going on. But we just want to stir up your conscience a little bit. Stir up your conscience a little bit. So we want to catch him, catch us unawares. Let's do, try God's way and see if our joy don't, doesn't increase. And we see we don't be freer in the spirit. So we can enjoy coming to service. We don't want to come late and leave early. Why? Because we got nothing there. We go to church, we won't get nothing out of it. Seems like everybody else is having the fun. Somebody can sing, I can't do nothing. Somebody's testifying, I can't do nothing. Well, you don't obey. You love yourself too much. Everything you do is for yourself. And that kills your joy in a hurry. All right? All right, let's uh, strive to be dear children of God, walking after the pattern that He left us. Hopefully, you don't feel like we're making it too hard. It's not too hard, are we? 
I mean, well, after all, we're not got no ball bat, nothing banging nobody. That's right. We don't penalize nobody with 30 days in jail or nothing like that, but it might be longer than that if we let too much of this stuff accumulate. Things that are less than spiritual and less than as dear children should be. All right. Let's not be disappointed to the place where we're going to be ungodly. Let's don't be displeased with the Lord. Let's obey Him. Let's stand. Real quick, now we ask if there's any announcements before we go. Make it real quick. Not time to praise the Lord now. All the time to praise the Lord. But uh, Sister Janie.